And Deputy First Minister, and I call Mr. Phil Flanagan. Government to call your case over here. Question number one. So the focus of the ministerial subgroup on regional opportunities has to date been on the North West, but it has always been our intention that it, as its work progresses, it should consider the measures required to promote economic opportunity across other areas of Northern Ireland. This will include, in due course, infrastructural and economic needs and opportunities in the South West area, including County Fermanagh. Thank you. And Mr Flanagan for supplementary. I thank the, the Minister for her answer. Can I take this opportunity to congratulate her on her elevation to the position of First Minister and wish her well in the time ahead? Um, would the First Minister accept that it would make some sense for um, the next meeting of the Regional Opportunity Subgroup to take place when the Executive comes to Fermanagh for its meeting, um, and that the focus of that meeting should be about potential um, infrastructural and other economic um, interventions the Executive could make to create um, economic opportunities in the county? Well, I thank the member for his uh, question and indeed his acknowledgement that the next executive meeting will be uh, in Enniskillen in the town hall there on the 25th uh, of this month. Uh, I take the view the fact that we're bringing the whole executive to County Fermanagh. It's even better than bringing the regional opportunity subgroup of the executive to Fermanagh. We have the whole executive there. Uh, I hope they take the opportunity uh, to get out and around in County Fermanagh to perhaps make some visits. Who knows, we may even have some announcements made when they're there as well. Um, but uh, I do hope that this initiative of bringing the executive closer uh, to the people that elect us uh, will make it more relevant to people on the ground and also allow some of my colleagues from the east of the province to visit the most beautiful county in Northern Ireland. Thank you. And I call Mr Gregory Campbell. As part of the Regional Opportunities Group, can the First Minister endeavour to make sure that Northern Ireland does have the best possible mobile phone network across all parts of rural Northern Ireland so that people can uh, communicate by phone, text, uh, by other social media outlets like Twitter and Facebook, and they can do so effectively, safely, and without the prospect of running up a huge bill directly or indirectly? Well, absolutely. And uh, as the member is probably aware, in my previous work in the Department of Enterprise, Trade and Investment, we did make a number of interventions uh, in terms of mobile phone coverage and indeed in terms of broadband coverage as well. And I very much welcome the fact uh, that my colleague, the Deputy Minister, uh, just recently announced another broadband intervention to pilot. Uh, areas have been identified, one of which is County Fermanagh. Uh, so I would encourage uh, everyone to have a look at that broadband pilot and to take advantage of what's available to them. Yeah. Thank you very much. And I call Mrs. Joanne Dobson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Question number two. Uh, Mr. Speaker, with your permission, I will ask Junior Minister Pingelli to answer this question. Mr. Speaker, with your permission, I will answer question two and ten together. Social Investment Fund momentum is growing. 25 projects valued at 37 million have commenced. 10 projects are operational, and many hundreds of participants are already benefiting from early intervention and employment projects. It is making life-changing differences to people and communities facing disadvantage. No groups in Upper Ban are waiting for SIF funding for MoFM DFM. Indeed, there are four projects, committed commitments of around 6.3 million, which are expected to impact on Upper Ban residents. These have all received the letter of offer from OFM DFM, and it is now over to the lead partner to progress further. Good progress is being made, for example, work at has recruited participants, sustaining the infrastructure and new directions of appointed design teams, and the community sports programme has received a letter of offer. Thank you. Ms. Dobson for a supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I thank the junior minister for the answer and update? I note that the Southern Steering Group last met on Tuesday, the 1st of December. Can the junior minister then explain, given the long delays with the fund and the pe impending end of this assembly mandate, will the groups meet more frequently to move processes along? I thank the member for her question. Um, I'm not sure if the member is aware, but the steering groups are independent of the Office of First Minister and Deputy First Minister. It was the hallmark of this scheme that this was a community up scheme. It is not dictated to by 
Um, it is not influenced by um, the Office of First and Deputy First Minister. It is up to the local steering group to meet. And I am presuming that they meet whenever they feel that they need to meet. So it may be an issue that the, the member wants to raise with uh, her party colleague in relation to the local steering group and with other members of the local steering group. Thank you. And I call Mr Sidney Anderson. Speaker, and can I thank the junior minister for her answers so far? Uh, junior minister, now that all the projects are being progressed, can, can you confirm that the Social Invest Investment Fund objective to ensure a wider benefit, uh, that all, <laughs> ensuring that for a wider benefit, that all traditional schemes such as the DSDs uh, neighbourhood renewal has been achieved? I thank the member for his question. Uh, I can confirm to him that uh, whenever we were designing the Social Investment Fund, we listened to the frustration of very many people, community organisations and communities, that felt excluded from the very uh, tight criteria of a number of schemes, such as neighbourhood renewal within the Department of Social Development. They made it absolutely clear to the First and Deputy First Minister in particular that there were considerable needs in relation to dereliction, in relation to community halls, in relation to employment, childcare, educational underachievement, much, much wider than simply just 10 per cent of the uh, areas most deprived in terms of the multiple deprivation indexes. And therefore, I am glad, now that we have looked at all of the projects that have come uh, through under this uh, scheme, that there will be much, much wider impact. I am glad that places like Portadown and Banbridge and Fermanagh and Market Hill and uh, large parts of my own constituency in South Belfast can benefit from this scheme, whereas before they were excluded. It has taken time in order to achieve that because it is a different way of working, but I am glad that those areas will benefit and they will see this progress on the ground. Thank you. And I call Mr Conor Murphy. Uh, the renegotiation of the United Kingdom's membership of the European Union is being taken forward by the Prime Minister and a select group of ministers within Whitehall. The Deputy First Minister and I will be meeting with the Foreign Secretary on the 1st of March 2015 and we will uh, raise matters with him face to face. This issue directly affects everyone in Northern Ireland, so we specifically have requested engagement from the UK Government. Unfortunately, the request has not secured a meaningful response in terms of the detail. We have been kept informed of developments, but we have not been involved. Thank you. I call Mr Murphy for his supplementary. Uh, I thank the First Minister for her response, and I, I share her obvious frustration at the dismissal of the concerns, not just of the people here in the north, but also uh, I think Scotland and Wales are, are suffering the same uh, sense of, uh, of, of being ignored and treated with contempt to a certain extent by the British Government. Uh, given that the proposal uh, seems to be for a fairly close referendum on the, on the other side of our own Assembly election, uh, does she share my concern that there, there has not been a proper debate about the disastrous consequences, particularly for here, uh, of the British Government and essentially the people of England deciding uh, to leave the European Union and the consequence that has for our people in our farming communities, uh, people along the border area, uh, people in business here, uh, and those very serious consequences have not been uh, debated properly and will not get the opportunity to be debated if we are forced into a referendum very closely on top of our own election. I well, thank the member for his question. I mean, I, our concern in terms of the date coming so close uh, to our own uh, assembly election was that all of the issues in relation to the European referendum would come on top of the assembly election issues as well. So there would be a, a lack of clarity in relation to those issues. Now I accept. Um, people have said to me, do you not think we can make up our minds in relation to the Assembly elections and the European uh, referendum? That's absolutely right. But I have to take cognizance of the fact uh, that the European uh, Union referendum campaign will be a national campaign and therefore it will get national attention and it will be on our screens uh, a lot of the time uh, at the same time as we are fighting uh, an assembly election when we want to set out our own particular visions, no doubt, of where we would like to see the assembly and Northern Ireland going to in the next uh, four years. So it is a problem. It's something that we're going to have an opportunity to discuss um, with the Foreign Secretary. I have to say uh, it may be too late at that stage because, of course, we're very much aware uh, that the um, Prime Minister hopes to close the negotiations off uh, this weekend coming. 
Um, I regret that um, because if they are uh, to give respect to the devolved administrations, then they should be listening very carefully to what we have to say uh, in relation to, never mind about the substance, and I hear what he says about the substance, we would uh, probably have differing views in relation to the substance, but I think we can all agree on the fact that we need a very clear debate in relation to the referendum, and unfortunately I don't think that's going to happen. Thank you. And I call Mr. Mike Nesbitt. Mr. Speaker, the uh, Minister's colleague, the Enterprise Minister, spoke in the House recently about the various options that could be available if the United Kingdom were to withdraw from Europe, the Norwegian model, Swiss model, uh, Turkish model. Could the First Minister share with the House her assessment of the pros and cons for Northern Ireland of those various options? Well, I think it's important that uh, we have a very clear referendum. He may prefer different types of models. Whether It's up to him whether he prefers a Swedish model as opposed to a Turkish model. I can't comment uh, in relation to those issues. What I can comment on is the fact that we need a very clear debate in relation to the implications if we remain and the implications if we leave. And Unfortunately, we haven't been able to have that debate as yet. Of course, um, we, uh, we haven't had the conclusion of the negotiations. We do have to wait on that, but it looks very likely, uh, Mr Speaker, as if we will have those uh, negotiations completed this weekend, and then things will become very clear. Thank you. And I call Mr Paul Given. Uh, speaker, can the First Minister confirm that whatever the United Kingdom's relationship is with the European Union, that she will ensure that we continue to benefit from the most important relationship of all, that being Northern Ireland's place within the United Kingdom? Well, of course, uh, uh, I will continue to make sure that the union uh, between Northern Ireland and the rest of the United Kingdom is to the fore of all that I do. Uh, and uh, as the fifth largest economy in the world, that is a critical uh, part of, uh, of our future, and uh, we must make the most out of that. And indeed, it's part of our selling point when we go across the world that we are part of the United Kingdom and benefit from the regulatory system that the United Kingdom gives to us, including, I have to say, in relation to the current issues as well. So absolutely I agree with him that that is a critical uh, uh, relationship going forward and will remain so. Thank you very much. And I call Mr Gordon Lyons. Thank you Mr Speaker. Question four. Uh, Mr Speaker, with your permission I will answer questions four and five together. Lead departments are undertaking an outcomes-based approach to the individual success of the initial six programmes announced in October 2012. More detailed reports on particular projects are anticipated from lead departments in due course. Three further signature programmes, being jointly funded with Atlantic Philanthropies, are progressing well in the areas of early intervention transformation, dementia services and shared education. In line with the Programme for Government Commitment, OFMDFM is currently evaluating the success of the Delivering Social Change Framework. It is hoped that the evaluation findings will be available in the near future. You and I call Mr Lyons for supplementary. Can I thank the First Minister for her answer so far, but specifically could she give me her assessment uh, of the success of the Literacy and Numeracy Programme? Well, as the, uh, you are aware, Mr. Speaker, the Literacy and Numeracy programme very much a critical part of the Delivering Social Change framework, and that was completed in June of 2015. And it is hoped that uh, uh, we will have the full evaluation uh, very soon, as I've indicated. But already we know that some 18,653, very specific, I know, Mr. Speaker, uh, primary and post primary children have received additional MAS and English supports as a result of this programme. I think that's a phenomenal impact to have made in terms of additional help and support. And on average, 85% of uh, these pupils have achieved or indeed exceeded their individual target level in literacy and numeracy. So we have made uh, a big impact in relation to the literacy and numeracy programme uh, and I also very much welcome the fact that we were able to employ over 300 uh, recently graduated teachers as well to assist with that programme. I think we have made a huge impact with it. Thank you very much and I call Mr David Michael Veen. Speaker and I thank the First Minister her answers so far. The Minister will also be aware uh, that another central component of the Delivering Social Change initiative was the Nurture Unit programme. Uh, I wonder could the Minister give us uh, an indication today uh, of the impact uh, so far of the Nurture Unit programme? 
Well, this uh, is another uh, fundamental part of what we were trying to achieve, and I've had the opportunity actually to visit uh, in the short term that I have been in post uh, a couple of these nurture units um, which have been in place in primary schools. And again, uh, they have made a, a big impact in relation to those children who have been able to avail of the help. Uh, over 400 children have uh, attended a Delivering Social Change Nurture uh, group, uh, but then there are other children as well uh, within the 20 schools who can benefit from the short-term support, support uh, in the nurture room uh, if needed. And indeed, when I was going around uh, the various nurture units, I was being lobbied very hard uh, to try and make sure that these nurture uh, groups continued. And I know that the Department of Education are currently looking at funding to allow this to happen because I think they recognise uh, that this early intervention has made a, a big impact in getting kids ready uh, for schooling get, because before this there, were, there was a real difficulty with that uh, and in fact there were many children being presented at school and they weren't ready for school at all but these nurture units have made a real difference to those children. Thank you and I call Mr Oliver McMullen. Can I ask the Minister how will any review or evaluation of the Delivering Social Change programme help to inform any new programme for government process? Well, as I've indicated, we're hoping that the um, evaluation is looking at the outcomes, and I've mentioned uh, a couple of figures in terms of the number of children we've been able to interact with, uh, whether uh, through the nurture groups or through literacy and numeracy, uh, but we're looking at the impact that those um, schemes have had on the children. Have they improved since they were involved in those schemes? Uh, and the, the early evidence is certainly indicating that they have really benefited uh, from the interventions, because you have to understand and remember that delivering social change and the framework approach was a completely new way of bringing these projects to fruition. And the idea was to make an intervention, and then if the intervention uh, was a positive one, then that, that would be mainstreamed, perhaps uh, through other departments. And I'm hoping that that's what's going to happen in this case. Thank you. And I call Mr John Dallet. Mr Speaker, I welcome the, the Minister's uh, response so far, and particularly the improvements she indicates in literacy and numeracy. But would the Minister agree with me, given that we have 250,000 people between the ages of 16 and 64 with serious literacy and numeracy problems, that this particular issue shouldn't be dependent on charities, even ones as noble as Atlantic Philanthropies? Well, I think um, the way in which we're working with Atlantic Philanthropies is to have a co-design so that they come in and they work with us and then we design a programme that is good for society because you know, we've talked about this a lot recently about the fact that government can't do everything but what is it that we can do along with partners perhaps in the private sector or indeed in the third sector that could make a real difference and I think this is a good example of that. Atlantic Philanthropies are an absolutely marvellous organisation. They do a lot of good in our society and I think the fact that they're working with us through OFMDFM will make a real difference and I very much welcome the approach. Thank you and I call Ms Sandra Overend. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for the details she has provided this afternoon. Given the success of the Literacy and Numeracy programme, uh, can the Minister tell me, did the Minister of Education make a case for it to be streamlined rather than closed down last year? We did. Well, as I've already indicated, the whole idea behind these um, programmes were that we would come along, we would uh, have an intervention, we would evaluate as to whether uh, that had made a positive impact, and then hopefully other departments would come alongside uh, and take up, because it was never intended that OFMDFM would continue to fund literacy and numeracy or indeed nurture units, because there is a recognition, um, of course, that those belong uh, in another department. So once the evaluation has been completed overall, in terms of delivering social change, it will then be a matter for uh, the Minister of uh, Education as to whether he wants to take the issue forward. Thank you. And I call Mr Jim Allister. The former First Minister Peter Robinson and the Deputy First Minister wrote to Lord Alderdice, Professor Monica McWilliams and John McBurney in December with the terms of reference for the three-person panel which is to bring forward a strategy for disbanding paramilitary groups before the end of May. The Deputy First Minister and I subsequently discussed the matter during our quarterly review meeting on the 14th of January with the Secretary of State, Theresa Villiers, and the Irish Foreign Minister for Foreign Affairs and Trade. 
On Tuesday, the 9th of February, the Deputy First Minister and I met with Lord Alderdice, Professor Monica McWilliams, and Mr. John McBurney to discuss their work to date. Thank you. And I call Mr. Alistair for a supplement. Does the First Minister still think that one of the signatories to a fresh start, namely her partner Sinn Féin, is inextricably linked to the still active IRA, as she said in September? And if she does still think that, does that amount to an acknowledgement that she's in government with the IRA, Army Council and all? Well, the last time I looked, uh, my partner was somebody completely different, but that's another matter. Uh, in terms of the Fresh Start Agreement and what we agreed in that agreement, it is very clear that everyone who signed up to that agreement, and I'll refer him to the various parts of that Fresh Start Agreement. I don't know whether he's had the opportunity to read it as yet. And in that agreement, it says very clearly that no, uh, other, uh, that no party to the agreement will accept authority, direction or control on our political activities other than our democratic mandate, alongside our own personal and party judgment. It's very clear to me that we have set out a, a very good roadmap to dealing with paramilitarism, something that hasn't been dealt with to date, and I regret that. But in this piece of the Fresh Start, we've set out a very clear roadmap to deal with the issues. It includes having a paramilitary uh, strategy, a strategy to disband organisations that have been referred to. Uh, we have a task force that has very clearly been put in place. And we have a pledge of office, uh, which I understand has been put into legislation as we speak in Westminster. So as far as I'm concerned, there's a very clear roadmap ahead. He may want to go backwards. I want to move forwards. Thank you. Order. Order. And I call Mr. Ian McRae. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Recently, the Secretary of State made a speech about the role of paramilitary groups during the Troubles. Does the First Minister agree with the sentiments expressed in, in the Secretary of State, or by the Secretary of State? And does she agree that it is time that paramilitary organisations go out of business once and for all? Well, I couldn't agree with him more, and I have to say that uh, I welcome the statement, the speech indeed made by the Secretary of State uh, last week. I think there have been attempts over this past uh, couple of months in particular, uh, if not years, uh, to try and rewrite what has happened here over this past 35 to 40 years. It's important uh, that the facts remain. And the facts are, of course, that 90% of those who were murdered in Northern Ireland were murdered by organisations who were, which were terrorist organisations. It wasn't the state that caused those uh, terrible deaths. And uh, I think it's important that we remember that uh, when we're having a narrative about what happened in the past. And certainly, as far as I'm concerned, uh, there will be no amnesty, there will be no rewriting of the past, and we will provide support for victims in their search for justice. Yeah. Thank you. And I call Mr. Ali Gatwood. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, the Minister referred to uh, the legislation tabled to Westminster in, in relation to the Pledge of Office, which includes a clause 7 the words to support the rule of law unequivocally in word and deed and to support all efforts to uphold it. In going forward, does the Minister agree that there should be no doubt, given the new Pledge of Office, there should be no doubt whatsoever? that that includes endorsing in word and deed the activities of the NCA in the North and, for that matter, the Criminal Assets Bureau in Ireland. Uh, I could give a very short answer to that uh, question, but of course it does. Uh, and indeed, he makes reference to paragraph 2.5 uh, in the Fresh Start Agreement, and those words that are there will be faithfully translated into the legislation, which I understand is to get its second reading in Westminster next week. I'm going to call Mr. Roy Big. Mr. Speaker, it was, of course, uh, as a result of actions of the Ulster Unionist Party that the issue of paramilitarism uh, made its way to the highest point on the agenda. But uh, following the paramilitary murders uh, in the autumn last year, we've recently had the murder just last week in Dublin involving paramilitaries from this part of the world. Would the First Minister agree that the community would like much more concerted and concrete action? to show how paramilitarism was being undermined and removed from our society. Well, I find it absolutely bizarre that a member of the Ulster Unionist Party can stand up without laughing and say that it was they who brought this issue 
to conclusion when they weren't even there. Um, the Fresh Start uh, Agreement uh, is a good uh, start to dealing with paramilitarism and criminality, and I look forward to the time when the Ulster Unionist Party admit that they made a mistake, Mr. Speaker, and they should have stayed in and dealt with the issue instead of walking away. Thank you. Thank you. Order. And I call Mr. Trevor Lunn. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Question seven, please, the Minister. Uh, Mr. Speaker, with your permission, I will ask Junior Minister Pingelli to answer this question. The Urban Village Team is currently undertaking a programme of <coughs> engagement within each of the five urban villages. Stakeholder engagement workshops are taking place until March 2016. The outcome of engagement will be the creation of integrated development frameworks for each urban village, which will detail in priority order the capital and revenue projects identified from the extensive stakeholder engagement. Funding for urban villages in 2016-17 will be allocated following consultations with all departments to identify funding requirements to pro progress headline actions of which urban villages is one. For a supplement. Thank you. I thank the junior minister for her answer. Um, could you perhaps give us a, a bit more detail about the time scale for all this, particularly in view of the intervention of the election, the summer recess? I mean, it could be, it could be Christmas before we know it. I mean, what's, what's the time scale? I thank the member for his question. Uh, we have appointed a team um, through the Strategic Investment Board to coordinate this. We do have a director brought in uh, under the Strategic Investment Board. Uh, that, will, that work will be continuing regardless of the election. That's led by a professional team. There's construction experts, there's um, urban uh, experts, there's regeneration experts, all part of that team. They've been engaging in some detail with local community, community organisations, but also community consultation events to really talk to the residents, for example, of the local communities and also the uh, retailers and the businesses in local communities. So I'm confident that this work will continue regardless of the uh, election cycle. Uh, the aim is to have these development frameworks produced uh, by the end of March. So we are looking at this stage at what about um, six uh, weeks away from having uh, those draft plans. There will be an extensive process of consultation. We want uh, the communities to very much own these plans, to see their ideas reflected in them, and for these plans to be workable and be able to be phased in as well. So once we get those plans, those will inform funding decisions. Uh, for the way forward, probably uh, scheduled over the course of the next uh, you know, sort of two, three and five years to give us some indication about what kind of drawdown that we need. Uh, we expect the programme to be a largely capital programme, but because at the very heart of this under Together Building United Community is around uh, building the social capital of these communities, there will be a project or revenue element around encouraging identity, confidence and, and, and uh, community uh, spirit within that. Uh, we are already working on some of those projects around events, around cultural identity, around education and capacity, capacity building while we are consulting on what capital works are required. And in many of these areas, there is a need for, for capital investment. I call Mr Gordon Dunn. Mr Speaker, and thank the Junior Minister for her answers. Can the Junior Minister advise what plans other ministers have to maximise support for rural villages from other funds which may be available? Yes, uh, I thank the member for his question. I think there's really two very distinct elements of the Urban Village Programme. One is the additional funds that will be given uh, centrally through the Together Building a United Community uh, Fund, uh, particularly in the support of tackling dereliction, physical regeneration <coughs> and some of the project support I mentioned. The second element of it, though, is to help many of these communities to have better coordination um, and better maximisation of uh, what are existing or external funds. So that may be identifying a plan of action and looking at where the most appropriate fund for that may be. So it could be, for example, European funding, it could be funds under the the Department of Social Development or the Department of Communities as it will become. It could be local government or perhaps uh, entirely external uh, funding to government. So we want to be able to both support these communities directly through the Northern Ireland Executive but also to maximise the benefit through better coordination and the identification of other opportunities. Thank you very much. And, uh, I'm afraid that's the end of time for listed questions. And we now move on to topical questions and I call Mr Danny Kennedy. 
you, Mr. Speaker. Could I ask First Minister, uh, how does she react to the recent comments of the Chief Constable uh, on dealing with the past? Well, I have to say, um, I think we all, when we make comments in relation to the past, need to be very careful that we're not adding to the trauma that many people live with on a day-to-day -day basis. And indeed, some of those who I've met recently have been recounting to me how <coughs> something is said may not be of uh, a big moment to the person that has said it. However, when it's heard by those victims, they are deeply hurt and are deeply, many of them can be re-traumatized. So uh, I will say that um, I certainly don't agree that a line should be drawn onto the past. I think we have to deal with the issues. I, have, I think we have to go through the processes and we will continue, as I've said over this past couple of days in particular, we have to support the victims to get to justice if that's what they want to do. Indeed, he knows, having dealt with victims' families in close quarters, that some people uh, want to get to the truth, others want to get to justice, others uh, simply want it all to go away. But for those who want to search and continue to search for justice, we must continue to support them. Commissioner Kennedy for supplement. First Minister for her answer. Can I ask the First Minister to confirm, uh, to confirm that there are currently no discussions or negotiations taking place at present with any other parties on the issue of dealing with the past? Well, as we indicated after um, the Fresh Start Agreement that we would continue uh, to discuss issues, particularly uh, with victims' families, um, with various groups, and those matters are continuing. Indeed, I have a number of meetings today uh, with various families and victims groups and we want to listen to what they have to say to us so it would be wrong to say there are no discussions taking place. Uh, in terms of the outstanding issue which prevented uh, agreement uh, in the fresh start around dealing with the past, that is uh, particularly an issue, as I understand it, for discussion between Sinn Féin in particular and our own government. So those issues may well be continuing, but as far as I'm concerned, I am an engage, engaging and listening at the moment to the various victims' groups. It is not in this place, so I call Mr Trevor Clark. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy, or, Mr Speaker. Um, can I ask the First Minister, given the much work that you had done in relation to the reduction of corporation tax in Northern Ireland, what you're going to actually do now to actually attract more jobs to Northern Ireland whenever the corporation tax is lowered? Uh, thank the member for his question. It's not uh, a question of waiting until April 2018, which of course, as he knows, uh, has been the date set aside for uh, the devolution and reduction of corporate tax here in Northern Ireland. We have to start um, selling the proposition now. Uh, Invest Northern Ireland uh, are currently setting about a programme um, <coughs> to let the rest of the world know what is happening here in Northern Ireland in April 2018. Uh, and indeed, when I go to the United States in March with the Deputy First Minister, we will be undertaking some visits uh, in relation to this very positive story for Northern Ireland um, that will allow us to um, speak to companies that heretofore we haven't been able to attract, uh, not just to talk about the proposition that we already have, but the fact that we are going to have a lower rate of corporate tax. So uh, those will, meetings will take place in March in and around the St. Patrick's Day events. And Mr. Clark for a supplementary. Uh, can I thank the Minister, First Minister for that answer? I'm sure, First Minister, given your opportunity now to get to America, that you will also use that opportunity in terms of the lower corporation tax and all other incentives that actually demonstrate that actually Northern Ireland is the best place in Europe for investors to come. Well, certainly we'll not just be talking about corporate tax, although that is a new tool for us to talk about, but we'll also be talking about the other issues, the, the fact that we have a low cost base here in comparison to other parts of the United Kingdom and indeed the Republic of Ireland, the fact that we have a very young, able, skilled population here, uh, the fact that when companies come, the staff are, are very loyal to those companies and work very hard for those companies. So we have a very good story to tell, and it's the reason why we have been able to attract uh, the number of jobs um, that we have been able to attract over this past five years, indeed more jobs than at any time uh, during any other administration here. So uh, we have a good story to tell, but now we have an even better story to tell, and I look forward to telling it. Could I um, ask the Minister, um, that given that uh, last week we had a proposal from uh, the SLP that you would take £800,000 from the Department's budget, 
um, and allocate that elsewhere. Could you give us some indication of what that £800,000 might actually mean in terms of services uh, provided by the Department? Well, I didn't hear that last week. Uh, people are always wanting to uh, dip into the budget of OFM DFM, um, but you have to understand, I'm sure the member does understand, that our budget in OFM DFM has been uh, cut by 5% uh, from the baseline last year, uh, and therefore our resource is just uh, a little over £59 million. So if you were to take close on a million pounds out of that, it certainly would have an impact on other services. I thank the, the, the Minister for that response. And, um, as I say, I think we would ask the Minister would you concur that um, we would remain people that the services provided by the Department include very essential services to asylum seekers, refugee uh, seekers, and people, for example, who um, are reliant on the Department services, like the Victims and Survivors Service, for example, very important services? Well, absolutely, and of course, he will know that we have allocated uh, more money. Um, uh, indeed, we have protected uh, the Victims and Survivors Service, so uh, that certainly would be one that we would not be entertaining. Uh, and it goes to the point again, point I used to make frequently when I was Finance Minister, that it, we have a fixed budget, and if you take money uh, from the pot that we have, then understandably enough, money is going to have to be cut from another service that is delivered. So people should remember that when they're making pleas in terms of uh, more finance for X, Y, or Z. Well, that's all very good, but can you tell me where you want the cut to fall? So that, that's the key issue uh, when you're arguing with a fixed budget. Uh, and he mentioned um, ethnic minorities. I think I'm very pleased to say that. The Ethnic Minority Fund is now open for applications. I know it's uh, an issue that was raised, I think, at my last uh, question time. So I'm glad to say, I think on Friday of last week, Mr Speaker, that fund is now open for applications. And I call Ms Claire Hannah. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the First Minister for her question so far. Um, uh, paragraph 1 in Fresh Start refers to uh, the period after FM, DFM are selected and the Dehaunt process runs. Representatives of the parties who are entitled to take up places in the executive and who confirm their intention to do so will meet to resolve the draft programme for government. Can you confirm uh, what your thinking is on when parties would be required to uh, notify or confirm of their intention to take up executive places? Well, certainly, and indeed, in recognition of that commitment um, in the past, uh, De Hunt had to run, as far as I can recall, within seven days of the election. Uh, under the legislation that's currently going through Westminster, it'll be 14 days. So that gives us a little bit more time uh, to come together uh, and to decide on the way forward. So um, 14 days will be uh, the period of time before we run to hunt, so we will need to know in that period of time whether parties are going to take up uh, positions in the executive or not. Anna for supplement. And can I confirm, do you intend this provision to be in place in the next mandate, i.e. this May, uh, and if so, will that be reflected uh, by amendments in the legislation that's going through Westminster? Well, it's actually in the legislation, the 14 days, so uh, yes, I do intend that that will be uh, operative after the Assembly election. Um, the thinking is that it will give us time to have conversations and also to look at the programme for government work. As you know, there's work ongoing at the moment in relation to that, but obviously it would be disrespectful of the new mandate if that were finished before the elections came about. So uh, that work will be completed uh, during that period of time as well. So 14 days uh, and then we'll have our new government in place. I call Mr. Jerry Kelly. Uh, Ken I would like to ask the uh, First Minister, could you give her views on the news, I think this morning, maybe yesterday, that the NIO um, approved a, a request from the PSNI to withhold documents in the murder of the 15-year-old Arlene Atkinson, bearing in mind, I think, that uh, this was not described and never has been described as a conflict-related uh, death or disappearance. Well, in rising to answer that question, I'm very conscious of my answer to Mr Kennedy's question at the start of these topical questions. I certainly don't want to add to the very obvious distress and trauma uh, which the Arkansas family are going through at present. One of the most horrific uh, murders made all the worst by the fact that um, Arlene's body was never 
uh, found and now here we are nearly 22 years later and we're having the inquest. It is a very difficult time for the family. Uh, I hear what the member says in relation to the PII uh, certificate. Um, I'm a little unclear as to whether the coroner has the right to uh, make a judgment in relation to the appropriateness of that PII certificate. Um, I'm reading conflicting reports in relation to that, but certainly uh, it's something I know that is causing a lot of distress at present. Thank you very much. And I'll call Mr Kelly for a supplement. Thank you, Minister, for her answer up and I agree with her in terms of the sensitivity of this. However, it has uh, uh, come to uh, public attention in a very uh, dramatic way, and, and I agree with her in terms of the family. But it was in listening to uh, the family uh, this morning on the radio that uh, I, I suppose I'm asking, uh, um, or do, does she believe that it can compound uh, the difficulties and, and grief for the family uh, themselves uh, that these documents have been refused? Well, of course, the member understands that uh, I don't have sight of any of the documents he's referring to, and it's impossible for me to make a determination in relation to that issue. It is obviously a matter for uh, the Northern Ireland Office and the Minister who made the determination as to why he made that determination, and uh, therefore I would advise the member raise those issues with him. Thank you very much. And I call Mr Daniel McCross. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, could the First Minister outline if she is confident that future funding will be secured for the development of the A5 beyond this year's budget, um, and whether this will form a top priority for the next programme for government? Well, as the member is probably aware, uh, we identified seven strategic capital projects uh, in our budget for 16-17, recognising, of course, that we couldn't set the budget for those strategic projects because we were only dealing with a, a single year. Uh, but one of those strategic projects is certainly the A5. Call Mr. McCrossan for supplement. Uh, thank you for your speaker so far, First Minister. During the Transport uh, Minister's announcement of the consultation, she said the development of the A5 would be subject to successful completion of statutory procedures. How confident is the Minister that such procedures will be overcome and that the A5 will be delivered for the people of the West? Well, I hear my colleague saying DRD, and it is a matter uh, for the Department of Regional Development. Obviously, I'm not au fait with all of the particular statutory processes that have to be gone through in order to allow uh, the road to proceed. But all I can say to the member is that uh, this is a commitment that all of the executive have signed up to. It's in our budget. Uh, in terms of being a strategic proposal along with the A6, along with a whole list of other issues. But I think that this is something that will happen for the people of the West. And that certainly in terms of infrastructure, we want to see all of Northern Ireland benefiting uh, from good infrastructure. And that means good roads as well as good broadband and all of the other elements which some people in this country take for granted. Thank you. And I call, or Mr Paul Frew is not in this place, so I call Mr Phil Flanagan. The First Minister I think, has previously announced that herself and the Deputy First Minister intend to travel to America during the month of March. Can she give us an indication as to what sort of meeting she intends to have with political leaders and business leaders in America? Well, it's Mr Flanagan's lucky day. He starts the day off with me and he finishes the day uh, off with me in terms of questions. Uh, well, we do intend to have uh, some uh, meetings which have been organised by Invest Northern Ireland in terms of the issue I was speaking about in relation to corporation tax. But we will have some political meetings as well. We will have the uh, Northern Ireland Euro breakfast, which is always a, a highlight. And uh, I'm very much looking forward to that as well. And to bringing the good news from Northern Ireland that we have a stable government that is looking forward to the future and planning for the future and that people should look to us to invest. Mr Flanagan for supplement. I thank the First Minister for her answer and I applaud her efforts to send out a positive message that we now have a stable government here. But could you give me a commitment that as part of her um, meetings with political leaders in America that her and the, the Deputy First Minister uh, might well raise the plight of citizens from this part of Ireland that are living in America um, and are deemed to be undocumented in the continuing campaign that exists to get them the um, ability to travel back to Ireland and go back into America legally again? Well, certainly if there are any uh, residents of Northern Ireland who have difficulties in the USA, I'm certainly happy to speak in relation to those matters and perhaps if the member would share the information with me, I'll be able to take the issue up. Order and uh, time is up. And uh, well done, Minister. You get through them all. And if 
members, we take the reason until we change the top table.